so yeah my work persona um is that i graduated as a marine scientist and then i got lots of experience working in fisheries aquaculture and seafood so i've kind of spent a decade working in fisheries aquaculture and seafood that's been within like a bit of research a little bit within ngos and now kind of like still within a charity but a lot more lent over to um working within the fishing industry and now my job is the executive director of a fisherman-led charity called Fishing Into the Future. Um, I think as important as like telling you my work persona, um, also just to tell you about myself, like this is one of the most important things for my job is that I don't have a work persona and a non-work persona. There's obviously some boundaries I put up when I'm like interacting in professional environments. But like, I think it's really important. We just know each other as humans. So um, basically to do with like what I feel like I am, I work really close with fishermen, but I'm not a fisherman. Um, I've never been fishing. Um, I also am not a social scientist, but I think a lot of my work revolves around social scientists, so social science. Um, I think I have got no, I don't know. I, I'm, I've just have a lot of experience, but I'd say I'm a bit of an, an expert and I just make it work. Um, in addition to working in fisheries, I am a parent. I like love going on adventures and I really love cycling. Um, I have set up like with a friend, a kick, a community interest company that's about um, like empowering people in the local community to learn more about like how like in, like working on their house and like doing improvement skills. I speak Spanish. I lived for about a decade in Chile. And I also know how to upholster furniture. Most of all, like I'm a human. So I think that's really important when I introduce myself that you don't just know me as like Emma, she's the executive director of Fishing Into the Future because that would be really boring. Um, but yeah, Fishing Into the Future, we are a yeah UK charity established in 2015. Um, where our tagline is that we're charting a course towards sustainable and prosperous fisheries. But the most important thing I think about the charity is that it was set up by fishermen. It's for fishermen. I kind of help corral that, but everything I do I'm just like a, you know, it gets fed through me and I put my touch on it, but all of the things I do are advised and to fit in kind of with what is needed within the fishing industry. Um, so yeah, we say that we are charting a course towards sustainable and prosperous fisheries. What does that mean? Um, first of all, what do we mean by sustainable and prosperous? We marry those two things together because we understand that sustainable environments also require sustainable communities uh, interacting with it though, within those environments so we put those um, at the forefront of what we do um, who's part of these fisheries we work with the small scale sector as well as the um, you know the larger guys larger boats uh, seafood processing so we're very much kind of you know, try to be all encompassing and include everyone and bring everyone to the table because we think that kind of underpins good relationships um, and when we say charting a course we think that the way to get to sustainable and prosperous fisheries needs to be underpinned by co-management and industry-led and collaborative science. So what we're trying to do is to get everyone in a position where they can, um, yeah, they can work together on sustainable management and have uh, really credible science that has got everyone involved, fishermen and researchers alike, in building that science together. Um how do we actually do it? So we kind of say that what we're trying to do is encourage everyone to work together effectively. And it, it almost, if you could look at what we do and be like, this seems like an like an extra add-on to like making things work. But I like to think it's actually, we create the foundational skills to make, um, you know, fisheries management and co-management and science work. So we have like learning opportunities or we create opportunities and spaces for people to share knowledge create connections, strengthen their bonds, build confidence and develop skills um, to work together on these things. So um, what we do is, you know, our, our main bread and butter is that we do these three day events where we bring together scientists, fishery, uh, fishermen and uh, fisheries managers in order to um, work on, on work together. And then they should go away and work together better than they did previously. Um, so yeah, that's a, it's kind of important that you know what I do and then I can kind of tell you how I got there um so I've put up together a bit of a career timeline and I'm going to take you through like what I did to get to where I am today um and then I'm going to tell you what was like actually important within that timeline so in 2006-2009 I got a first class honours degree in marine biology at Newcastle University 
Um, then I got my first job as a research assistant um, at a scientific research station in Chile and Patagonia. Um, then after I did that job for a couple of years, I decided to go back um, and I studied a marine science, um, an MSc, so a master's in marine science. Um, and that was like an Erasmus Mundus course that was between Southampton, Bordeaux and Bilbao. That was really cool. Um, then I did my MSc thesis in conjunction with WWF Chile. And then I got a job at WWF Chile. And then I left WWF Chile and I joined Fishing Into the Future. Um, but what I'm going to do is I'm going to take you through because that actually like, like, for example, working my ass off in my third year to get a first class honours degree. Did, like, I wish I hadn't done that. I wish I'd done some other stuff. That wasn't important to where I am today. Um, so yeah. Oh yeah. And then the last bit was that I've just put on a couple of successful events where I've got over 60 people, including fishermen, uh, scientists and like top people at DEFRA all to these events. So yeah, I was just, just to round that off, but yeah, what was, what actually mattered? So I'm going back. How much, how much time have I got? I think I've still got a few minutes left, haven't I? Yeah, good. Okay. So, um, in 2006, my mom was like, why do you want to study marine biology? Apparently the average marine biologist makes 12,000 pounds a year. And I was like, and she was like, you should do something else. Why do you want to become a doctor or a lawyer? And I was like, cause I obviously got the, I will work my ass off for stuff. Um, even when it's probably not that useful. And I was like, oh no, I'm willing to risk it. It sounds fun. So I told my mom in 2006 and then went and did a degree that I don't think anyone in my family thought was useful at all. Um, and then while I was at university, rather than working, actually what was a lot more useful for me is I spent lots of time on boats. So I tried to take every opportunity that was given to me. Um, I worked on the university research vessel, vessel that was run by like two retired fishermen. I... Um, took opportunities I went out to Canada and I worked for the Department of Fisheries and Oceans like for three or four weeks like going out on vessels I just spent as much time on boats and around fishing communities um as I could then when I left university I there was the financial crisis so all my friends got jobs in call centers and I was like oh that sounds really boring and a friend of mine who was a bloke had an opportunity to do a uh an internship in Chile and I and you had to have some you had to be like a marine scientist and have uh, the ability to dive in cold water so I was scuba diving at the time and I had both of those abilities and then all of a sudden they rejected him because he would have to share a room with another woman and the woman was like I don't want to share a room with a man so they came back to him and they were like sorry you can't come anymore um because this person that was here before you uh doesn't want to share a room with a with a bloke and then he was like, reached out to me and was like, do you wanna to go to Chile and do this internship? So yeah, that's how I ended up going to Chile. Um, that was a huge pivotal part. Rather than working in a call center, I went to Chile. That was like a really good thing. Then I worked in Chile for two years as a research assistant, which was really cool. But I met so many like important people working in marine science in Chile. And basically I was a research assistant, but also it was a really remote, station and people would come for two weeks and then we would party <laughs> um and I was the person that would be like hey come over to like my big like big accommodation where I live tonight and we'll do something in the lounge um so I was a party host and I met loads and loads of people uh then this is a bit of a personal one so I was there um as you do when you like live in Latin America you fall in love with someone and then I like freaked out and I was like oh I don't want to like stay in Latin America I'm gonna go and do something else for myself and then like I like last minute applied for this um yeah I applied for this master's in um the Erasmus Mundus one and got it so I left chilling um to go and like you know better myself because I didn't I wasn't ready to like stay in Chile forever um and then in 2014, while I was doing my thesis, I was like, I want to go back to Chile because I really like it there. And I met all of these great people. Um, so I got funding to well, kind of got funding. Um, I reached out to some people from WWF who I'd met and they paid for me to do my my thesis idea because it was also it could also be like an interesting project for them to use in their work basically so we like co-created this really cool project and then I went like visiting like over 800 miles of Chilean coastline talking to fishermen which was brilliant I think that like really got me into what I was doing now um then I handed in my thesis in 2014 and like three days before I handed in my thesis no three days before I defended it so between that period before I between handing it in and defending it I found out I was pregnant 
Um, so yeah, that was terrifying. And I just went along with it and ended up having a baby. So in 2015, I had a baby. I just worked a what a whatever job to get statutory maternity pay. And then I had a baby. And then while I was on maternity leave, I managed to publish my thesis. And I went back to everyone that I had spoken to while I was in Chile. And I shared that paper with everyone. So that was really important just for like people to remember me. Um, yeah, then I went to Chile and then I came back to, oh, I should probably, I was probably something interesting happening there. There was a pandemic at one point when I was working at WDF Chile and I was like, I don't think I want to live in Chile anymore. I think I want to come back to the UK when I can go where I can go out and buy milk without having a, <laughs> yet to have like a, an authorization from the police basically to go out and do shopping during the pandemic. And that's when I managed to get a job fishing into the future. And then I've just spent the last two, three years trying to get to know people, um, to really know people in order for them to get on board with what we're doing and come along to our events. So I think I've already talked for 10 minutes. Is that about 10 minutes? Great. I will start there. No, that's great. Emma, I'll let you go because you're incredibly busy, but thank you so much for sharing your story. I'll, I'll hang out for a bit because I want to hear some of the other speakers. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Perfect. Well, then, um, next up, we've got Elizabeth, um, who's calling in from Shetland, and Elizabeth is working on a fishing boat for whelks. So, Elizabeth, do you want to tell us about yourself and about your experiences? Hi, yeah. Uh, um, yeah, my name's Elizabeth. I'm 47, and I suppose I'm an um, accidental fisherman, one woman. <laughs> um, it's not something I ever set out to do. Um, but, uh, oh gosh, I don't even where, I don't have a nice little slideshow done up like Emma there, uh, note for next time. I've never done this before. In fact, the only reason I said yes to this is because my initial response was like, hell no, <laughs> I'm not doing any public speaking. I don't like public speaking. It makes me very nervous. So this is a personal uh, challenge. <clears throat> so yes, uh, it started with chess. Um, last January, it would have been, uh, I, I, I love playing chess and I started playing um, a new person at the Shetland Chess Club who is a the lawyer uh, a lawyer <laughs> and as a kind of a stress relief he helps a friend on a fishing boat and he's like Elizabeth come out we're starting with the bucky fishing I think you'll really really like this and I started it as like oh my word this is amazing absolutely fantastic but I only ever went out when the weather was kind of decent and I had the time for it and then uh, after um, the buckies, the the mackerel started, and mackerel fishing is just exquisite. It's like it's it's uh, it takes all the boxes for it for amazing. And then um, in the middle of the summer, um, my skipper had well, he wasn't I wasn't paid at that time, but um, he he had a heart attack. <laughs> Uh, so he was over on Fair Isle and he had a heart attack. And so the, the Coast Guard helicopter airlifted him to Shetland and then took him to Aberdeen uh, on the Sunday night. Monday morning, he had a um, uh, surgery. Tuesday morning, he had surgery. Wednesday, rest. Home on Thursday. And Saturday, he's like, Elizabeth, OK, let's go. We have quota. <laughs> so but he wasn't allowed to lift anything. So all he could do was kind of like steer the boat. So I did all the work and he took me on his paid crew then. And that's it. That was my the rest of my summer, um, right into the end of October, I suppose. Um, and then this year, um, yeah, I'm I'm paid crew, and I go out with them like as often as we possibly can. Um, so it's it's Bucky's now. Then the mackerel um will be coming, and then uh cod, um, and crab and lobsters, and um, is there something else? Yeah, that was it. Um, <clears throat> yeah. Um, so it's not something I ever set out to do like I'm Canadian I've lived in Shetland uh, 25 years now and so the first time I'd ever really been on a boat was when I took the north well it was P&O ferries up from Aberdeen I kind of just like knocked on the, the door and I was, <laughs> he was like are you going to Shetland it was the uh um the cargo vessel as well the freight vessel uh and the ballast isn't quite the same and it was just like oh. And it was a 14 hour journey from Aberdeen to Orkney to Shetland. And I couldn't even get out of my bunk. I would just get up and I would spew and I would spew. And I'm like, I am no, no. It was seven years before I left Shetland after that because I wasn't getting back on a boat again. Uh, but 2013, <clears throat> um, I, uh, 2012, I, I volunteered with the RNLI um, in, up in Eighth, so Britain's most northerly RNLI station. So I came on board as a press officer and then I started training as crew. And I loved it. And that's where I got my sea legs. And and like, oh, it was just a super bunch of, bunch of guys and fantastic organization to be with. 
And then, uh, yeah, this was, I'm, um, I'm almost three. <clears throat> Uh, so my youngest is 15 now and he can get himself up and ready for school so I can go off fishing at five in the morning and know it's it's fine the school will phone if he hasn't showed up so <laughs> and uh uh but <clears throat> um yeah challenges um being a lady fisherman I suppose hair I have lots of hair <laughs> Um, so oil skins, there's a certain way you have to put it on because you can't. I can't tie it all up and put a tori on because I got too much, too much of it. So put the oil skins over over the top of it. Uh, toilet. My toilet is a mop bucket, um, and sometimes I have to crawl over things to get to it. And yeah, uh, constant bruise shins and um, strength. Um, I'm only I'm only tiny compared to the lads that that, that do this. So I um, I'm a lot stronger than I was this time last year, I suppose, but um, I just lift more often, but lighter, <clears throat> if that makes any sense. And um, a training, I suppose, is is an issue as well. I'm wanting to get um, more more tickets and stuff, and it's proving a little bit challenging to to get, but I've done all my um, sea fish and uh, training, and um, yeah, I absolutely love it. I do other things as well. I, I run other other jobs uh, too, but I I there's something honest. It's like a proper day's work. You're out, outside. The you know it doesn't matter what the weather is. Like the sea's like slapping you in the face. It's still fine. The boat's just going like that. You just get on with it, and that's why I like it so much. Like there's no drama. You just you just do it. It's like there's a problem. There's no like mm, let's have a meeting and figure out how we're going to fix this. Like, you just fix it. <laughs> get on with it. There's just it's uh, and there. It's a really supportive group of folk. I suppose when, when I first started, they'd be like, oh, who is this? And now I'm just one of the guys and it's fine. I love it. Is that 10 minutes yet? Yeah, no, that was fab, Elizabeth. Thank you so much. So no, thank you so much for sharing your experiences and both yeah, you and Emma. It's been great. Oh, wow. Well. Um, Cara, we'll lead on with you now. So if you want to chat to us about your career and your experiences um please go ahead um hello Cara Brideson fisheries innovation and sustainability I have a good presentation I've really enjoyed this almost wish that we weren't uh, we weren't recording all of it because there's so much I want to say but we'll keep that for the Q&A's afterwards but um the first thing that's just come to mind is looking at Emma and Elizabeth's experience and I hope when you hear about mine isn't it brilliant that we didn't have a plan? And I really worry about my 17 year old who's doing our hires just now. And a lot of that age group, they seem to think that they have to make a decision now about what they're studying, what they're gonna do. And, and I know it's financial and I know it's cultural and it's what they're pushed into, but I just don't want young people to have a plan because then you don't get the Emmas and the Elizabeths and you know, you'll see a bit of, I had no plan um, and it's turned out all right. So I, I don't know how we tell young people to give it a go, but it really worries me that financially, especially if you come from the kind of background I came from, you feel that, you know, you, you really have to know what you're doing to justify any expense. Anyway, that's me going off um, on, a, on a tangent. So I am the Executive Director of Fisheries Innovation and Sustainability. We bring big players along the seafood supply chain together to look at innovation, whether it's new things to do, new ways of doing things um, along the supply chain. We have, you know, my, my board are people like Sainsbury's, Marks and Spencer's, Seafish, um, Young's, now Safina, and also the Fishmongers Company, but we have an advisory group of loads of different people. So I'm really lucky that I see the industry from one end to the other and lots of folk all around the UK. But this is all not, it wasn't part of the plan. Um, so I grew up in a rural part of West Scotland uh, in the middle of the miner strike in the 70s. And so obviously I wanted to be a dolphin trainer in the Navy. That was just, you know, given that both my parents had came from kind of bad sheep farms right next to each other. Obviously, being in a really landlocked area, I wanted to be a dolphin trainer in the Navy. Don't know how I forgot about that. Ended up studying English and history um, and had no plan, but 
ended up working in lots of conflict areas all over the world, it was in Afghanistan or Liberia, um, Kosovo, Sudan, lots of places. And there being no plan, I ended up working with International Fund for Animal Welfare, looking at uh, alternatives to whaling and sealing in communities. And it was very much about not pointing fingers, listening to people, working with them to try and find, well, what's kind of financially the best thing that you can do? Anyway, the, I literally didn't know one end of a whale from another. Um, and But because I'd had an experience working in, in, in kind of conflict areas and lots of places, I was really interested in, in how kind of cultures manage the unmanageable. And when there's things that are really black and white, trying to find those gray areas and be able to work with communities um, rather than telling people what to do. So anyway, I thought, yeah, I'll go in and work with these strange marine people. Um, you know, they don't have guns. How hard can it be? I'm sure it'll be dead easy. And I just got really sucked into the whole marine area and um, jumped forward a decade or so. And I was the head of marine policy for RSBB Scotland for about 10 years. And it was when I was there, I just got really sucked into this whole thing of fisheries. And it's because it ticks so many boxes. And that's what I want to say to people today or anybody who does listen in to this later is it's it's people and it's food and nutrition and it's the most complicated politics you'll ever you'll ever come across um and it's international relations it's you know social ethics and it's animal welfare so whatever floats your boats you can help and you can expand that and you can you know, with all of those things, why wouldn't you want to work in, in the sector? And I always say you work in the sector. Even when I was working with NGOs, you weren't working against the sector. It was, it's not an us or them. It's folk muddling on together for sustainable and prosperous coastal communities. Is you know, that should be everybody's everybody's aims. Um and you know, I, I was really lucky with the RSPB. I still love them. They're a fantastic group of people. Um, and I think one of the things I want to say, look at, you know, Emma came out of NGOs. Elizabeth's worked for lots of different groups. What makes people think that they can't cross in to the fishing industry? There's an awful lot of people coming out of those uh, universities with great skills that we can use, but why would they be more likely to think they'd be a better fit working for WWF or, or others and not thinking of coming in to the kind of things that we do? That was always interesting to me. The way that I made that transition, I suppose, um, I suppose it was a bit of a, a bit of a hustle. RSVB are really supportive of their staff and I was given this chance to have a secondment. And I thought, yeah, I really want to understand more about, about fisheries. So I, I, I went up and I worked uh, in a number of fish markets uh, to the Natural History Museum's fishing department and just really tried to learn my, my master's because it was posting in those days, posted off the envelope and I got and I got a master's. But that was the first sort of proper academic um, validation of what I was doing, even when I was the, the head of marine policy for the RSPB. So, you know, it was important for me to tick that box. Don't know whether it was necessary, but it felt to me to be uh, important. Um, what was more important was just asking questions and going out and speaking to people and learning. Um, one thing I that was really useful that you know, probably more useful than the masters and everything else, which I just did because I felt I needed to. Um, so when I was on the, I had this, the, the sabbatical, this convent from the RSPB, uh, and I was up, you know, just trying to meet people in ports and harbours. And I was on my way back to Edinburgh from Herehead one day, and I was just about to go and get the bus. And this van turned up and somebody shouted out, are you yon bird queen? Which means, are you the bird woman? 
And uh, and I was like, eh, yeah, I think so. And he was like, get in the van. Now, I am not advocating getting in random vans for teenagers hanging out at the house. But, but they drove me down to the boat and said, listen, this is what I think about these things. Here's this newfangled thing called marine protected areas. National marine, here's, here's how I view it. And we sat and we talked. And I see that guy fishing news awards every year and I say you're it's your fault that I'm here because I just learned from them anyway um it's it's that uh, taking every opportunity to to experience things whether it's travel now unfortunately I don't think there's as much money for this in different organizations but Fez fishmongers company sea fish organizations like that that can support um, knowledge exchange, trips, travel bursaries. We've done a lot of those in the past. There's not as much money as there used to be, but they're really important in terms of cross-fertilization of ideas and getting people to travel and experience things. Because I know how I fell into this, as you know, we talked about it at the beginning. I, I know it's more difficult if you're coming out of university or college with a massive amount of debt it's hard to have that flexibility to look for things. But so if I can support people accessing grants, um, if, if you're all can help identify people. The last time that Fishmongers Company and Fizz, we put out a call for a knowledge exchange bursary, we got so few applicants. I think part of that is because people are so busy doing their day jobs, but we all need to encourage folks to take that time to go and experience things in different places. Anyway, RSVB have been so kind to me, let me have this experience and learn, worked with European fisheries agencies, worked, um, worked with regional advisory councils, lots of European fisheries politics. So to thank them, I left and I went and worked for the for sea fish. I didn't know what part of fishing or seafood I wanted to be in. And it was great to be able to go to an organization like Seafish that really runs the whole gamut. So I was able to learn about um, things like the dark arts of food service, weird things like frozen at sea, um, meeting people like Julie who knew about this stuff. Um, and, I, and then I learned uh, an awful lot. Um, so, where I am now at Fez, I'm so lucky that I can learn lots about, you know, whether it's artificial intelligence and precision fishing, it's about looking at novel fuels. Now, every time you look at a strange area of whether it's about vessels or supply chains, there's great women working there, really great women working there. And yet still, Whenever I have to introduce myself, I have to stop myself from saying, sorry, I'm not a fisherman. I'm not working in the processing sector. I'm not a scientist. And I say that all the time and I'm making myself stop it. Um, and one of the things that makes me realize that I have to stop this is when I was reading, this is something that when uh, Hannah, I remember you and I went up to speak at the museum and it was for the International Association of Women in Seafood Industry. It was part of um, International Women's Day, something like that. And it was saying that while we meet an awful lot, of, we in this country, we do meet a lot of great women in our industry all the time, but actually grossly underrepresented at all levels of industry in the rest of the world. So while rep women represent, I'm reading this here, women represent 90% of all jobs in the seafood processing industry, but less than 10% of corporate board members and less than 1% of CEOs. So while I think we're surrounded by women at a certain level of the industry, we aren't when you think globally. And one of the reasons I bring this up is that every time there's something in the fishing news or other seafood newspapers, uh, there'll be stuff underneath it saying, or what she's talking about, she couldn't tow a straight line. Well, you know, no, but there's lots of other things that I can do. And the industry as a whole is really lucky to have people like us that can help them be resilient and sustainable and prosperous. So 
every one of us here today, we have a place and we need to take up space and we should be valued. And uh, I'm really grateful to be able to let off steam in front of fab women like yourselves. So thank you very much.